This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, with Matthew Cobb and his cat. And my cat. <laughs> Sorry about this. Right. Yeah, and he's he's a professor of, of biology and, and zoology at the University of, of Manchester. Uh, also the author of, of a number of books. Um, I've got a couple of them here. Most recently, a book called As Gods, A Moral History of the Genetic Age. Um, uh, just before that, you, you came up with this one, another book that's very historical. It's called the, the Idea of the Brain, the Past and Future of Neuroscience. Also got this nice little book on smell, which is kind of uh, your, yeah. your specialty. Um, a very smell, a very short introduction. Other books in the topic, Life's Greatest Secret, the egg and sperm race, and then a couple books about um, history, right? I mean, I guess these yeah, are all histories history. too, but um, the, the Resistance, 11 Days in August, which are really all about kind of World War II. Welcome, Matthew. Yeah. Great to be here uh, with my cats. I hope they don't uh, walk in front of us too much. Right, right. Well, look, um, so this book, I mean, they're all historical. Um, this one is a, a moral history, uh, and it, it really not, is, not my is title. about kind of the, well, <laughs> okay, but it, 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 but it does touch on this because it, it really yeah. is about how, it's about the rise of genetic engineering, but it's also about kind of the, the social reception of it, right, and yeah, how absolutely. We, we think about it. And, and I think, you know, a big part of the story is that there are kind of the, the hope people and, and the fear people. Right. And you kind of need the hope people and the fear people in order to make sure that these new technologies stay on track. And and what I find interesting is that a big part of the story is how genetic engineering has replaced kind of nuclear power as sort of a touchstone of our ambiguity about scientific progress and, and how we feel about it. Um, and, and, you know, you probably published this just in time because my guess is that artificial intelligence is going to is going <laughs> to completely supplant genetic engineering and nobody will be oh. thinking about genetic engineering you know pretty soon uh, because people are obsessed with that but but you know when we say genetic engineering this term engineering and I, I teach engineering is is always thought of as distinct from science in the sense that science yeah. is really all about observing the world and engineering is about kind of interfering with the world and um, and I think there was this quote that you uh, had from Richard Feynman on his blackboard, I guess, when he died, where he said, what I cannot create, I, I cannot understand. And, and this seems to be yeah. like the, the engineer's <clears throat> mantra, right? You know, where we, we take things like Absolutely. molecular biology and, and move it into, you know, some kind of practical science. Like, how do we use this to, to kind of improve or change the world? Yeah, that I mean, that's the phrase that uh, the more engineering end and the more kind of tech bro end of uh, genetic engineering uh, apply. I I'm not sure it's actually true uh, in that most of what we do with genetic engineering was actually imagined and conceived and understood well, well before it became a reality. In fact, in the 1950s, with the development of once DNA, the structure of DNA was discovered and people like Crick worked out how it might function in producing proteins, then people pretty soon started imagining, so it wasn't a reality, well, maybe we could move bits of DNA between organisms and cure diseases or get bacteria or other microbes to do amazing things. And that's actually what happened in the mid-1970s when, following the discovery in particular by, by Paul Berg, who went on to win the Nobel Prize, um, that... Uh, it was possible to take DNA from a virus and put it in a bacterium or vice versa. And ultimately, in the mid-1970s, to persuade bacteria to produce the precursor of insulin. This was the big breakthrough, which uh, led to the tech explosion in, in, in the mid-1970s and later. Uh, the patenting of life forms, which was allowed in the US from 1980 onwards, there's a huge boom. And, and you know now anybody who uses insulin uses insulin that is made in a microbe, not insulin as it used to be that was gouged out of a, uh, a pancreas of some cow or, or pig that uh, died in a slaughterhouse. And that insulin is much safer, much 
better than the insulin used to get from an animal. And, and when they actually did the experiment, and it worked to everybody's amazement, because th th they didn't actually take the DNA sequence of human insulin because they didn't know what it was. They took the uh, amino acid sequence, which was known, so the structure of the molecule, and then imagined what the DNA sequence could be, because the genetic code is what's called redundant. So there are many uh, amino acids that are encoded by more than one three letters of DNA called a codon. And so they just, they came up with an idea. They put this DNA into a microbe and they said, it's amazing. It turns out that Watson and Crick were right. <laughs> so the idea, you know, even before you could make it, you could, you know, you could turn it, take it apart and make it again in, in Feynman's terms and then fully understand it. Had been understood almost on a theoretical level and predicted uh, back in the 1950s and 1960s. Well, before we dig into some of the scientific details, because you know, I, I'm although I, I feel comfortable with a lot of aspects of evolutionary biology, some of the details of genetics are still a little okay. hard to grasp. Uh, <laughs> Sorry for me, uh, but 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 I want to step back to the to the big picture, which is, you know, why is it that so many people feel so much unease around things like genetic engineering, right? Why is it that we think of this as playing mm. God? Uh, I mean, do you think that this, I mean, is this just, has this always been true with new advances in science? I mean, you don't think that, oh, when they invented, you know, the, the wheel or when they figured out how to wow. build the arch, you know, do you think people are like, oh my gosh, we know we're, we're playing God here, building, you know, arches. And I mean, it, it have like you read any 19th century novels? Have you read any 19th century novels? <laughs> They're full of, you know, anxiety about, for example, the railway system. So railways were seen uh -huh. as, you know, because they were so transformative as being utterly uh, radical. I mean, they, they shake up society. They enable me, people to move about. They move extraordinarily fast. Uh, think of electricity. And uh, although it's not actually named, that's what underlies uh, the, the creation of uh, Frankenstein's monster in Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Mm -hmm. So uh -huh. new technology generally does disturb us if, it, if it's very widespread. I mean, you know, look at all the fuss about screen time and, and uh, you know, are, 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 we, are, are our dopamine systems being hacked by uh, our phones? Answer, no, they're not. But that's what, that's what it feels like, yeah, because you can get addicted to this endless uh, scrolling. So technology always has this very kind of dangerous aspect when it's introduced, and then gradually it becomes slightly less alarming. And that's kind of happened with nuclear power. Uh, I mean, with the beginning of the, uh, of the with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it kind of suddenly reemerged with the threat of nuclear war. Um, but in general, people are much more relaxed about it than they were, say, in in the sixties. And I think the same thing has largely happened to aspects of genetic engineering, many of them. And what, one of the things that kind of demonstrates this is if uh, I deal with this in the last chapter of the book. I, I suddenly thought, well, what what has culture been saying about it? Because culture is generally a good indicator of what society mm -hmm. thinks about it, what, what we think is exciting, frightening, whatever. And I couldn't think of any major cultural creation since the 90s, in fact, since Jurassic Park, about the, the fears and the issues associated with genetic engineering. Uh, and although the Jurassic Park franchise has continued, it's not actually about... The, the moral dilemmas, which are at the heart of the book and then of the film. That is, you know, your, your scientists were so busy about thinking whether they could, they didn't think about whether they should, uh, as it's put in the film. Um, but that seems to be accepted now. I mean, the films are just about when are the dinosaurs going to go crazy? We just want to go and see angry dinosaurs. We're not interested in that moral issue. And it seems to me that that has signifies or suggests that many people are kind of accepting of it. Uh, I mean, in the US, if you eat your maize, then your corn, rather, we call it maize, you call it corn, um, then you're going to be eating GM corn because it, that's all you produce over there. Uh, and people may not like that. I mean, there's nothing to worry about. I don't think there's any evidence at all that there's any health problems. Um, and so these things have kind of been accepted in, in Europe and in the UK for the moment. That doesn't enter the human 
uh, food chain, but it does. It is eaten by by animals, and we then eat the animals if you eat animals. So these things have kind of calmed down enormously, and that's partly why I wanted to write the book because there are three things that do worry me uh, very much. At least one of which is maybe two of which people are aware of, and the third one they're not. And I wanted to one alert people. But also, I recognise that my fears are very similar to those that occurred in the mid-1970s, for example, when genetic engineering was first developed. Yeah. And it turns out that those fears were, well, whether they were in, you know, unnecessary or not is not clear, but certainly they have not caused the catastrophe that some people feared. So I wanted to kind of test my own anxieties against the past and try and work out whether I'm making a fuss about nothing or whether I'm right to be alarmed. Yeah, what I really liked about that was that, you know, when you start off the book, you say that you're worried about these three things, right? Heritable gene editing, right? You know, gene drives. Uh, I talked to Beth Shapiro about gene drives in an earlier okay. episode. Yeah. And, and, and gain of function. Now, of course, I mean, gain of function is something which has been in the news quite a bit. And, and it seems yeah. like the stakes are around the lab leak hypothesis for, for COVID. Um, you know, for me, this just seems like a simple scientific question like hey you know is it lab leak or not right but you know i think for a lot of people this they're 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 worried about the outcome of that whole uh story because they're afraid about the the consequences either one way or the other for the, this type of research and some people want to yeah. protect the, the the research and some people want to kind of you know prevent the, the research but but and we'll, we'll dig into all three of those but well, what I liked about the fact in the book is that you say, hey, I'm really worried about this. And then you start off the story by talking about these folks from the 60s, you know, these these folks who are, you know, protesting. And they kind of come across as, as Luddites. I mean, I don't think this was your intent, but but they, they kind of come across as Luddites in, in the book. And, and so you're kind of it seems like you're, you're, you're philosophically asking yourself, like, am I a Luddite for, yeah, absolutely. for worrying about this stuff? Yeah, right. I don't. I mean, I, I, and, I don't, think, I don't I am, think you but, answer one way or the other. <laughs> well, I don't think I'm yeah. a luddite. I think I'm right to be uh, very wary, and I think I certainly am a luddite about uh, human heritable genome editing. I'm uh, very strongly opposed to it on uh, moral and practical grounds. I think it's a very bad idea. Um, in terms of the other two things, then uh, the gain of function studies. I mean, I, I do want to make very clear there is no evidence, and I don't know any of any scientist who argues that the COVID-19 was a product of uh, gain-of-function studies. There is no evidence of that. David Baltimore made some rather foolish statements at the beginning of the pandemic, but that there is no evidence of that. The People who argue that it came from a leak from the Wuhan Virology Lab, their view is that these were microbes that were being studied in Wuhan and got out, because stuff happens, you know. I mean, that's things can get out of labs, and they have done in the past. Uh, from what I, I mean, I'm not a vir virologist, uh, I'm not an epidemiologist, but my reading of the literature is that it seems almost certain that it came from a an animal, and probably from these, one of these most likely source seems to be a raccoon dog uh, that were being sold in exactly the place where uh, in the wet markets, if you remember that far back in Wuhan, where it see, was initially suggested it, it began. But this is a material question. It will be worked out. But there is no evidence that uh, gain-of-function studies led to that. On the other hand, gain-of-function studies are so alarming that in 2011, the researchers who were carrying it out decided they had to stop until they could make it safe. Uh, and they, they, the, the, one of the leading researchers said, I've done something really stupid, he said. Uh, and that is that he'd enabled bird flu, which is far, far more dangerous than um, than COVID. He'd enabled bird flu to be transmitted through the air like COVID from one mammal to another. Now, he was doing this for very good reasons. He was trying to see, is it possible? Should we be worried about this? Can it happen? And sadly, the answer he's found out was, yes, it can. But then you've got this thing in the lab that if it got out would cause something that would be far, far greater than what we've just been living through. It would be an absolute catastrophe. Mm -hmm. um, my view is that I don't think we need to know whether it's possible. I think we can be prepared for the worst, and that doesn't involve uh, creating such organisms in the lab. It's, it's not worth the risk. It's not worth the, any potential gain we might get.
But, uh, as I say, I'm not a virologist and this is an area uh, of dispute. But I have my I have the right to have well, my opinion as much as they do. <laughs> so what's what's interesting about this whole history is that this there's this event that took place, the uh, Asilomar yeah. event. And I had found out I, I didn't know about this until I was talking to Stuart Russell about the need for maybe an, an Asilomar moment in the kind of artificial intelligence yeah. community. Everybody but, always wants an Asilomar. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, everyone wants an Asilomar. But the thing about the Asilomar, the, the way you articulate it is, the way you describe it is that they never really addressed any of the ethical no. questions, like any of the big questions, like should we be pursuing this avenue of research? It was just about like, hey, how do we kind of make sure that it's, quote, safe, yeah. right? And, that, you know, there's nothing that, you know, leaks out of the lab, like that everything's kind of contained in the experimental world. But But there was no real discussion of should we even be pursuing this line of inquiry or you know should we be thinking about you know what we're going to do with it you know once we've developed it which, which seems kind of i mean that it, it doesn't really answer the key question like yeah. you're saying okay um let's make sure that lawrence berkeley lab doesn't have you know nuclear leakage but the, no real question about like okay now once we develop these bombs like you know what are we going to do with them <laughs> is that really something that scientists should be talking about or is that well, something that should be left to the you know, the, the, the ethicists and, and the uh, philosophers? Well, I think everybody's got to talk about it. And I think the time to talk about it is when you are developing, in fact, before you're developing. We can see this in AI at the moment. You know, uh, the fact that these AIs, which are remarkably stupid, but are also, you know, systematically racist. And uh, if you, you call them, them art artifi artificial stupidity. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, you know, if you leave them on their own, then they're going to cause all sorts of panic and chaos and could because they're simply reflecting what they've been trained on and the world is not terribly a ni terribly nice place so they just repeat and amplify that and i don't you know my worry isn't that we'll see the pope wearing a puffer jacket and think hey that's amazing the pope wearing which i did i'm afraid i was completely duped uh, but <laughs> that in fact it can be you one it can be used for to spread misinformation goodness me there's enough of that enough of that going around with humans create it uh, and then even more alarmingly, if these things are put into uh, devices uh, such as drones and so on. And that 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 does scare the willies out of me. And uh, I think the parallels between genetic engineering and uh, where we are now, not where we were in the nine, in the 70s and AI are really very appropriate. And never mind about the the, the rights and wrongs of that letter that was just uh, uh, published causing calling for a pause in ai development but i think something uh, it's not so much having a meeting it's having regulation because that was the point of asilomar that's what it did now what's very striking is that if you talk to scientists or you read the you know the, the opening chapters of a textbook about genetic engineering it will talk about cinema and scientists are really proud about of it because it was self-regulation they didn't get the state involved it was just them meeting and saying, OK, these are the criteria we can use to enable this to be done safely. And of course, that fitted in very much with a certain American model where you're very happy to have uh, low regulation. Uh, and what's striking is that there was no, as you say, there was no discussion. Not only was there no discussion, it was ruled out of order. So uh, David Baltimore was one of the organisers at the beginning. So as you can gather, he's still around. He's still doing his stuff. Um, he... Uh, he said very explicitly, we are not going to discuss a number of things. We're not going to discuss uh, either the possibility of carrying out gene therapy. We're not going to discuss commercial applications. And we're not going to discuss the potential use of genetic engineering as bioweapons. Now, what's amazing is that all three things were actually on the cusp. And two of them, financial, uh, you know, commercial applications and terrifying bioweapons, were actually being developed and the vast majority of people at Asilomar had no idea. There was just a handful of people who didn't actually overlap. So the Americans, a handful of the Americans, knew that patents had been taken out by uh, Boyer and Cohen, uh, by Stanford and by uh, by University of California um, to patent their way of gene cloning, as it was called. And that was known. At, uh, Paul Berg, who was the main organizer, he discovered about this a week or two weeks before the meeting, was absolutely livid, A, because he disagreed with the principle, but also he thought, well, now everybody's going to think the only reason we're doing this is to make money, to enable, you know, to have a, a safe procedure so we can all become filthy rich. 
so he they kept the lid on that uh, for for some time, and nobody it didn't leak out. The other thing, which nobody knew, I don't think, until I did an amazing piece of research which involved looking up names in an index, uh, is that the Soviet delegation to a cinema who were yeah. these old guys who the uh, in the accounts of the the meeting the um, uh, the you know the kind of young bucks of American genetics were la literally laughing at them saying these old guys know nothing you know they don't get it they're just the, the heads <laughs> of the academy of science you know they it's not they don't they're pretending they just don't get it we now know that two years earlier so as soon as genetic engineering was kind of you know Paul Berg had said yeah we can do this they went to Brezhnev and they said give us a load of rubles and we will build you a better weapon we will build you a bioweapon using genetic engineering and that is exactly what had begun in the Soviet Union and that was completely unknown to anybody. These guys were just these old foolish guys, didn't know anything. Oh, yes, they did. And they actually, it took some time, but the Soviet Union did indeed achieve that, created some terrifying things. And God knows where they are now, because with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the whole system was kind of privatized and then uh, disappeared. And who knows where they are now. Right. And you talk about that anthrax leak i think that happened in the soviet yeah union. The, the soviet like, union there was a, right. an anthrax leak that took place in the 80s and the the soviet union said oh well people are eating bad tin meat uh and then matt meselson uh the veteran molecular geneticist uh went to the soviet union was able to demonstrate that the the town that was affected is just downwind of a major uh, lab that was part of this huge network of kind of 50,000 researchers that spread all over the Soviet Union. Um, but I mean, there are, you know, who knows, who knows what's been made and what's been built since. And then, I mean, people regularly get very worried about this and in particular with the development of, of new systems like CRISPR, where it's even easier all the time. People say, well, you know, a high school student could do this. Well, high student, high school student can understand it, but Carrying out the technique is difficult. And then the really difficult thing, I'm glad to say, is weaponizing and, you know, enabling it to diffuse in the air. And, and even better, how to do that isn't actually shared by scientists. Those people who know, uh, you know, working in government office, government labs and don't don't release that. So I, I, I don't think we need to worry about terrorists producing uh, bioweapons. It's states we've got to worry about. Uh, all of our states, your state, my state, the Russians, the Chinese. I don't know who's got them, but uh, the Israelis, uh, it's a very worrying business. Well, there's uh, a moment in the book, um, I think part of the story is about these two things happening simultaneously where Paul Berg is, wins the Nobel Prize, but, but then also the founding of uh, Genentech. Yeah. Now, the founding of Genentech is a story that, that I know because I'm here at you know, Berkeley and Stanford and, and, and we, you know, this is kind of where all of this, this took place. And it sort of is not just a story of genetic engineering, but it's also a key part of the history of intellectual property yeah. in, in the U S and also it, it's really the, the beginning of the monetization of technology transfer from the, the universities. Right. I mean, yeah. because of the dole, by uh, legislation. Um, and, you know, the story about how uh, Boyer um, was kind of dragged into this, I mean, it's, it's phenomenal that you have this kind of unemployed venture capitalist who just kind of goes through the Rolodex of, of the Asilomar people yeah. and finds this guy, and and, uh, and the, the rest is history. Yeah, I mean, so this was the big, one of the biggest surprises to me. So, you know, I'll be absolutely frank with you. Uh, entrepreneurship and all that stuff doesn't really interest me, right? I'm an old-school socialist, uh, and I think invention should be taken and exploited by the state and all the rest of it. But... <laughs> Reading and writing about the Genentech business was so exciting. It was amazing. It really was. Uh, you could, I mean, it's been well studied, so I didn't, I didn't discover anything new. Uh, but it was a very, very exciting moment in history. I mean, of course, we focused on Genentech and they all became, well, some of them became filthy richer. Boyer did. Uh, um, but uh, there were loads of startups. And as is the way, uh, so many of them, didn't become filthy rich and it didn't or it wasn't great for everybody but for genentech it was quite the, the i mean it was a brilliant insight and the idea that they were going to go for uh insulin 
which was uh, Bob Swanson, the unemployed venture <laughs> capitalist who'd been sacked a few weeks earlier. And he got obsessed by it. Uh, and that was a brilliant insight and so sharp. Uh, and then her boyer, who's a lovely man. I mean, I interviewed him. I made a radio program about this during lockdown uh, on the BBC, which is available on there, called Genetic Dreams, Genetic Nightmares, folks. Uh, check it out. And uh, I interviewed all, all these people. Uh, everybody was alive. It's absolutely fantastic. Talked to Paul Boyer, uh, Paul Berg, who died earlier this year. Talked to Boyer. And Boyer was, is, is such a, an ebullient, delightful man. Uh, and, yeah, he ended up you know, going into this world that, I mean, he was a, you know, an old school academic. He never thought he was going to make a fortune, but uh, it worked. And I mean, you're absolutely right to say this is all part of the Californian myth, because as I was delighted to notice in reading the uh, Isaac's biography of, um, Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs, that Apple and Genentech were both incorporated the same week in uh, just down the road from each other in Silicon Valley. And I thought, well, that, that's, that's really telling us something. This, and indeed, you know, Apple eventually surpassed uh, Genentech's uh, OPA. Uh, but uh, when Genentech went public, the same day as Berg won the Nobel Prize, that was the biggest uh, offer that had ever, you know, largest amount of money that had ever been made on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. Well, um of course, uh, at the same time, you get this company, Monsanto, that is investing a lot in patented uh, genetic crops. And, you know, it's still, although I think everybody accepts the idea of genetically modified medicine, right? I mean, insulin is, is everywhere. You know, as you alluded to earlier, there's still quite a bit of anxiety around genetically modified food, so much so that it's banned in large parts of the world. Con countries in Africa that are experiencing famine will, will, will turn away, right, genetically modified food aid. Uh, so I guess culturally, like why, I mean, if, if I can see if there is a concern about things that you put in your body versus things you don't put in your body, but, you know, you put insulin in your body, you put vaccines in your body, right? Why, why is, well, why not is everybody, there right? still you know. this... Um, <laughs> So yeah, that's yeah true. so there okay, is an you know, there, there is an issue. Um yeah, I I mean I I can't I mean I think we probably need Sigmund Freud here. We've got to d delve very deeply into our collective psyche. Or maybe Carl Jung. Uh you know, it's a collective thing that there's something different about food and clearly food is is not simply stuff you put in your mouth. It's actually cultural, right? It's mm -hmm. part of you. It's part of your way of looking at the world. And that's one of the explanations why uh, China, for example, has been very reticent. Well, there's been a huge argument, which was one of the big revelations to me in working on this, that there's been this massive row in China uh, over whether they should allow GM crops, and in particular, GM rice. And uh, to the extent that they have allowed Greenpeace a remarkable degree of freedom within China to mobilise and campaign against GM crops. And you know, some parts of the Chinese army and bureaucracy think that it's a uh, an imperialist plot and it's going to you know, cause infertility and all the kind of nonsense you get. And other parts are very keen to develop it because China's got a very strong uh, appetite for genetic engineering, including, I might say, in the past anyway, in humans uh, with kind of eugenicist overtones in their, their views. Uh, but I think to go back again, this is something else that surprised me and was very striking. So Monsanto, well, it doesn't exist anymore. It's been taken over by a buyer. The names disappeared. But Monsanto got a lot of bad press. And to be frank, it deserved some of it um, because it was very bullying and all the rest of it. But the starting point of Monsanto was absolutely amazing. What, their, their interest in genetic engineering, the point they said, was to their CEO at the time, said, we've got to get out of chemicals because it produced, you know, AstroTurf, Asian, <laughs> Asian Orange, uh, DDT. I mean, what could be more awful? This was a company that, you know, was based on kind of destroying the environment. And in the late 60s, they said, we've got to get out of chemicals. We can't go on doing this. It's not sustainable. So this is a remarkably modern, you know, it sounds very you know, current the view of, of, of what we should be doing. And the, the brilliant idea they had was to put... A, uh, an insecticide producing gene, a naturally occurring insecticide, which is produced quite by chance by bacteria. I mean, bacteria don't care about insecticides. They produce this substance which will stop caterpillars growing. And the organic 
farming movement allows you to put this bacterium on your plants and they're still classed as uh, organic uh, because it's, you're not fiddling around with anything. So they took the gene from this bacterium, put it into a plant, and that was a whole really complicated and, again, very exciting area of science, which, I mean, I... I mean, I know about this. I've translated books about this his part of history and all the rest of it. And I was amazed to discover that nobody's actually, no, no historian has studied the history of the genetic manipulation of plants, which on a planetary scale is the most significant thing we've done, right? Uh, because it's been the largest take up of any agricultural technology. Uh, it's been incredibly significant. And as uh, Monsanto were uh, very keen to point out, quite rightly, it led to a reduction of about a quarter of a, mil a quarter of a billion tons, I think, of insecticide uh, that has not been sprayed around the planet. And that can only be a good thing. But this is a striking yeah. thing, that according to the US Department of Agriculture, there has been no increase in productivity. So this stuff is amazing. It's very clever, but it hasn't actually led to an increase in productivity. And we know the, the, the problems with Africa are partly ideological, uh, but, you know, Africa's a continent. It's not a, not a country. It's not even a region. It's a continent. So there's lots of different places mm -hmm. with different views. And the, the key example I use of, for the, to explain the problem is Burkina Faso. So Burkina Faso produces some of the, the world's best cotton, very, very high quality cotton. At the beginning of this century, the government got very keen on what's called BT cotton. So that produces this natural insecticide. Uh, so the cotton plant will produce a natural insecticide, and that means that the caterpillars won't be able to chew it up and all the rest of it. So they said to all the, all the, all the, uh, the producers, right, you're going to grow this cotton that we've bought from, I've forgotten who, some company in the US. But... The problem was the quality of the cotton that they produced, the plant that had been manipulated was a plant that could be manipulated in the lab. You put it into the fields in Burkina Faso and it doesn't produce the same quality of cotton. So the farmers found that they were they couldn't sell their product because their USP was high quality cotton. This stuff was OK, but it was a bit a bit rubbish that people could buy that anywhere. So they, they, the bottom literally dropped out of their market. So they've now decided, without you know, the government's accepted this, well, we'd rather take our chance with the, 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 the cotton borer and the, the various insects that will eat it and we'll have to spray. So the, the problem is this looks like a fantastic techno fix. Yeah, let's do this. Put this thing in there. It'll change everything. But it's missing out that agriculture is not one thing. It's got lots and lots of local systems that depend on uh, local uh, ways of farming, sizes of farm, ecologies. And also it depends on the organisms that you're manipulating. So one of the things which was inevitable has happened is that you now get resistant strains of insect. Because as uh, the biologist Leslie Orgel put it, evolution is smarter than you are. And so if you put a massive selection yeah. pressure on insects, they were going to kill you. Then somebody is going to get through just by random mutation. And then they're home free because, you know, they've got no competition. They can eat all your plants. And that's what's happened for both the, the for the two key forms of uh, GM plant we've created, which are either BT, so this insecticide producing plant, uh, and of course it doesn't harm us because we're not caterpillars, uh, or these uh, what are called Roundup Ready. That, that's the other thing. People often talk about diseases. Well, yeah, you know, we could stop plant diseases. It's fascinating. They have not developed such things, with a handful of exceptions. There's one banana that hasn't really worked, and there's a papaya that they've been able to re make resistant to a virus. But there are lots and lots of mildews and stuff. I've got terrible mildew on my honeysuckle every year. But there aren't GM crops that can resist these diseases. So it's this very niche stuff that we've created that does one thing, which may work in the Midwest, which is where largely it was created for, right? These huge farms where you've got very little ecology left because we've killed it all and eradicated it. That's OK. But if you're a small holder in Burkina Faso or South Africa or Uganda, it's no good. You know, my favorite part of the Monsanto story was the, where they found the, the genes for the Roundup resistant uh, crops in the uh, effluent. Yeah. Well, that's exactly <laughs> it, you know. Deposit outside, outside of the Roundup factory. I was like, well, that, that's, it reminded me, I, I did an episode on phages and, uh, they, you know, the phage that 
turned out to be a life-saving phage was found in a sewage treatment plant <laughs> outside the city of Baltimore, right? That's right. It's like, you know, where they where they find this stuff. But but I th- but I mean, look, genetic engineering is something we've been doing since the earliest hunter gatherers. Well, you know, no, yeah, no, the, yes and no. Einkorn, no, no, no. Einkorn crops, no, you know. No, that's not engineering. That's that's selection. Either deliberate or I mean either kind of unwitting or then deliberate. And that's very different from genetic engineering. That's why I, I, there's a huge, you can imagine academics will love this. I mean, there are whole books written about whether there was any break, there was any qualitative leap in 1975. Mm-hmm. It's all the same. We've been doing it for millennia. I mean, we've been doing it since, you know, humans first trod the earth because we've been putting a selection pressure on animals and plants by eating them, right? And they don't like that. And so there's, I mean, that's the, the, the kind of arms race that goes on in any, mm-hmm. any predator-prey relationship. But there's a difference between what we're doing now, which is moving DNA from one species to another, often without any great idea what's going to happen. Uh, but it's much more precise and it's directed. And for that reason, that's why the book starts in the 1970s, not in, you know, the plains of Africa, two million years ago or wherever where i mean you could make a case but i think it there is a difference between what we've been able to do for the last 50 years mm-hmm. well um you know is there a difference is there a categorical difference between somatic cell manipulation and uh sort of you know just creating these sterile crops or sterile creatures i mean is it is it is it is that categorically different Right, so if, I know, think so. Yeah, a difference between creating a yeah, so. yeah, creating a GM plant and a mule, say. Okay, so people realise that you could cross a horse and a donkey. Uh, I can't remember which way around it is, uh, and you'll get a uh, you'll get a mule. And mules are great. You know, they're very strong. Very, they got the best of both worlds. Um, got the intelligence of a horse, but they're not quite so skittish, and they're very strong. And they're bigger than a than a than a mule, and that's clearly doing something. But I mean. It, one, it doesn't go anywhere, yeah? I mean, that's it. Mm-hmm. They're sterile. So making of hybrids, uh, which has been incredibly significant. I mean, a lot of the, the, the plant revolution of the 20th century is based on two things. One, industrial fertilizer, and two, the development of hybrid crops, which are infertile uh, because they've been crossed between two strains that uh, are often from different species or whatever. So there's clearly a series of quality, quantitative steps towards genetic engineering. But I think there's a, a qualitative difference when you, you know pretty much what you're going to do, what you're putting in. This gene does this. We're going to put it in to do that. And that's a, uh, an element of precision and intentionality, which I think does make it different. So, so is are those two different types of genetic engineering? So, for instance, you know, if we have salmon in their in a ring fenced area and we manipulate their genes so that they have you know more meat or whatever, um, and they you know they leak out into the general population of salmon, if if they can't mate with them and if they you know can't um, create these hybrid offspring that have some of these new genetic features, it's presumably less less concerning. But you know, is 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 know some that, genetic? I mean, I mean, if we, I mean, or well, I mean, I, I, you know, you let something out in an environment they, they, does things, it eats things that other animals can't uh-huh. eat, or whatever. Um, I, I, I'd, I'd just say in passing that uh, the genetically modified salmon in the U.S. There's been a huge argument about it. I mean, they are held in plants in in big vats that are inland, so they're miles away from mm-hmm. any river. So they couldn't get if they get out, they're going to die. Uh, which is the kind of clever. Uh, bio containment uh, that scientists like. So if everything goes wrong, it's fail safe, right? If it goes wrong, we're okay. And that's the best way of, of trying to, 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 to plan it. Because we can't be certain. I mean, you know, ecology is just amazingly complicated. And you can think of the very well-meaning things we've done in the past of introducing species. Uh, the cane toad is the great example where they imported the cane toad into Australia to eat the beetles that were eating the sugar cane and they didn't care about the sugar cane. Uh, instead, uh, they turned out to be okay. venomous and the local marsupials tried to eat them and then they died and these things spread all over Australia. It's been a complete disaster. So maybe we could talk about this guy, huh. In, in, in China yeah. and kind of what, what he did um, and, and what makes that different from, say, the sickle cell therapies and, and the other, you know, SCID yeah. therapies that, you know, we think are, are, you know, potentially groundbreaking and promising, right? So is, is it really the nature of what this guy did or is it the, 
the the manner in which he did it that makes it so so troublesome and so worrying? Well, I think it's a bit of both, um, but I'll just explain briefly what happened. So in 2018, uh, he announced, and it was you know, released. It was it was scooped uh, by journalists very few days before he he announced it. Uh, he announced that he had uh, carried out germline manipulation. That is, he had changed the genes of an embryo when it was so when two, and it now turns out three baby girls were single cells. So the idea of this is that if you can manipulate the embryo, then every cell in the body will be changed. Yeah. And that would include... Including the germline. Including the cells that are going to go on to prefer, produce either the eggs or the sperm, and so would therefore be transmitted to the next generation. Okay? So this is, this is germline or heritable genome editing. And that's where the ethical... Uh, arguments, I think, are their, are their sharpest. The other kind of editing, which is really a, a form of gene therapy, which gene therapy was developed, I mean, there were a number of attempts, but really became possible in the 1990s and ended in various disasters for technical reasons, including one man called Jesse Gelsinger, who sadly died. He was a volunteer in, a, in an experiment. Um, the those therapies only affect the particular cell type that you're interested in. So sickle cell is the, the one that everybody's excited about, and they're excited about that for two reasons. One, it affects so many people. Um, and secondly, it is only a problem in your red blood cells where a single letter of DNA is altered and produces this form of uh, hemoglobin, which is the protein that carries oxygen, uh, which is different from the normal version, a single letter of DNA changing a single amino acid, alters the conformation, which means that the shape of the red blood cells is no longer kind of like a dumbbell, which is what most of us have, and is instead like a sickle, and sickle cell anemia. And that means, or sickle cell disease, as we now call it, you are anemic, you're in tremendous pain, and I mean, it's really awful, debilitating disease. So by, I mean, the the... the the dream, which has yet to be carried out uh, in humans, but will be very soon, is you could, and I'm going to caricature what happens, you get the stem cells from your bone marrow, which are going to produce lots and lots of red blood cells. You remove them, you put them in a test tube, you put CRISPR and these other gene editing things in there, and you alter one letter of DNA. Those cells then all grow, repeat, and you've got loads and loads of them. You re-inject them, and bingo, you're cured. Okay? Now... There are a number of uh, protocols to do this that are now being going through the American regulatory system. And soon the first, they're not clinical trials, these are experiments. Some very brave people are going to uh, have this happen. Uh, one woman called Victoria Gray, who you may have seen on TV, uh, she has had her sickle cell disease effectively cured, but not through this version. What they did instead was they used CRISPR again, the same idea, they got the cells out. But instead of changing the sickle cell gene, they kind of there's another version of hemoglobin which we have when we're embryos, and they that normally we stop producing that as we in, in early childhood, and instead they've kind of cranked that up. <laughs> okay, so they've turned that gene up to make it work again, uh, and she's cured. She's she says I'm without pain for the first time uh, in my life. So if these technologies can be made available cheaply and freely and if they are safe then somatic gene therapy I, I think most people have have no problem with it. the issue is one safety absolutely first and foremost and that's going to be hard to work out uh, and then equitable access and as David Liu who's a chemist at uh, Harvard very smart guy who uh, is developing even more precise methods of uh, doing gene editing uh, as he put it well we live in a world where there is not equal access to spectacles so how is this technology going to change equality? And when you put it that way, and we know, for example, that the vast majority of people in the, in the US who suffer from sickle cell disease are African-Americans, and we know about the US healthcare system and its inequalities, then I think you can see there's, 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 there's something odd going on here. There's a mismatch um, in terms of, I mean, this is very exciting. On a global, if you wanted to be very utilitarian about it and say, well, you know, let's get the maximum benefit out of our skills, then I would humbly suggest that uh, clean water, 
sewage systems uh, education for everybody all over the world, uh, you could do that for the price of all this, which is only going to benefit a few thousand people or whatever, probably. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not a utilitarian, but I think a lot of the people who are arguing this way often have a, a bit of utilitarianism in them. But sadly, bizarrely, they don't go for that. You know, clean water, sewage, not sexy, but saves right. lives. Well, look, I mean, I mean, well, to, to dig into that, I mean, in, in the United States, right, I mean, there is no clear line between what we might think of as medically necessary and what we might think of as cosmetic or you know yeah. enhancement right i mean yeah. i think most dentists make most of their money now from straightening and whitening right and you know you go in there and, and to the dentist and, and and they say you know you need to be whiter and i'm like okay now how is that going to affect my health well it'll make you feel better and it's like you'll feel more confident and whatever and it's like well what does that have to do with my with medicine right i mean and and that's that's where most of the money's going right i mean or at least a lot of the money so why would we why wouldn't we expect you know, instead of going in to have your sickle cell fixed, where you're right, there might not be a lot of money. Why wouldn't it be like, I want to go in and, and uh, you know, be, you know, smarter, better looking and, and all the all the other stuff. And, and <laughs> well, when you're because by the time it, it, kids. <laughs> ah, well, that's the difference. OK, so let's think about firstly, I mean, people have got to be clear that you might want to be smarter, but by the time you think that, it's too late, okay? Your brain's done. You're not going to be able to... <laughs> well, you know, you, we you have you no have, way. Suppose, suppose you're pregnant and you have, okay. you have a kid. I mean, even it could happen at the level of pregnancy or even before, right? I mean, you got your IVF oh. cells and, and they're sitting in a dish and you're like, okay, well, I want, my, I want my kid to be, you know, seven foot tall so he can get in the NBA, right? Right, well, when your child's born, give him a lot of food, okay? Go, go and live in Holland, right? So the tallest <laughs> nation on earth are the Dutch, and that is simply because of the Actually, food. Actually, I think it's the Montenegrins. The okay, Montenegrins well, whatever, are now whatever, you know, but, I mean, the, it is not genetic. If you are in Europe and you go to some ancient castle, take a look at the suits of armour. And these guys were about five foot nothing. <laughs> and that's not because they were midgets mm -hmm. or because there's some genetic thing. It's just the food. So, yeah, give your kid a lot of food. I mean, the same if you're pregnant, then there are some things you should take to avoid spina bifida, for example, uh, various supplements, uh, which are, none of these are genetic disease, but these are developmental effects. Uh, but, uh, but these are all things you can do if you're wealthy, right? You can eat lots of good food. Um, now, there's, uh, there, the U.S. is a, you're a very odd country um, because you have very little regulation. And, for example, germ cell manipulation germline manipulation is illegal in many many countries there is no federal law against it in the u.s so if you are a very rich person or a private medical institution and these exist you could do what you want uh as long as you passed your local ethics which is I and mean, if you're rich you don't even have to do that uh in the uk and in europe and in many other countries this would just be completely illegal you are not allowed to do that similarly in the US, uh, couples, there are loads of companies which claim to be able to uh, choose to enable you to select an embryo that will be smarter, taller, whatever. <sighs> that is illegal in the UK. You're not allowed to do any embryo selection for sex, for example. Uh, you're only allowed to do it uh, for particular genetic diseases. Uh, and there's a very, fairly restricted re list of them. And my advice to anybody who's thinking of doing this in the US is to save their money. Uh, just to give you one example, let's say you were a really big Nazi, right? And you really wanted to have your child having blue eyes. That was your, your aim in life. And you learn at school that uh, there are blue genes and there are brown genes and brown genes are dominant over blue genes. So, yeah, that must be dead easy. We can fix the blue gene, right? Make the blue gene come up and have a blue eyed baby. Big Nazi. Except we now know that basically, I mean, that school stuff is never true. It's, it's, whatever they tell you at school, it's always lies. And that's a lie as well. Uh, it's kind of true, but it is technically possible for parents with any colour eye to have any colour eye baby. I mean, some are pretty unlikely. So if you have got both blue eyes, it's pretty likely you're going to have a blue eye baby. But it's not guaranteed. Uh, and there are over 60 genes involved in eye colour, just in eye colour. Uh, in intelligence, I mean, there are genetic factors involved, but, I mean, it would, they are 
you've got to remember what, what this involves, and it's generally men who talk about this, right? Because all this involves IVF, and anybody who's listening, who's been through IVF, or who has a family member who has, know that this is no joke. I mean, for the man, you know, your business is done in a couple of seconds. It's all over with. But for the woman, she's got to have her set, her, uh, her eggs harvested, as they delightfully put it. And that involves a deeply unpleasant series of uh, hormone injections and all the rest of it. And you're still going to end up only with a few dozen eggs. If you want to increase the intelligence using genetics to have any perceptible effect, you would need hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of eggs. And even then, you would move it by the same, that your IQ score, for example, by the same amount as you can move your IQ score by having an espresso before you take the test. So, I mean, the companies are doing this. That's their business. People want to waste their money. That's fine. But, I mean, I think it is, it's a fool's errand and you're much better off caring for your child, giving them books to read, healthy food, outside activities, all the rest of that stuff, which is not rocket science. It's not sexy but it actually works. Well, I, I don't think people choose things because of they're effective. They choose them because they're bombarded with uh, ads. Oh, right. right. I and, mean, uh, and it's my job to say, know, maybe think about this and think about the evidence. Well, you know, you also mentioned cloning, right? And, um, you know, Barbara Streisand famously <laughs> cloned her dogs. And I, I know some people that have cloned polo ponies. Wow. Um, and, uh, you know some rich people. You know, there doesn't seem to be... The, I don't I mean, know anybody has got a, a, polo, a polo pony. Never mind cloned ones. <laughs> well, I mean, this this is um, th this this seems to be unregulated, uh, yeah. right? I mean, well, presumably it's it's if you try land to of the free, with, home with, of the brave, mate. You know, <laughs> that's uh, that's what your country's built right? on. I mean, you couldn't do that here. Uh, I mean, I, I guess you probably mm -hmm. could. Uh, you could you could clone a horse. Uh, I'm not. I, I mean, the issue of horses is really interesting because people have studied. Uh, I mean, there's obviously there's a lot of money in horses, racing horses, um, and trying to work out why one particular lineage or one stud is going to produce, or do they produce faster horses? I mean, it's it's really tricky. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, if people have got favourite animals and they want to have another favourite animal like that, great. But I bet it's not exactly the same. I mean identical twins who really are genetically identical right. aren't actually identical they're they are pretty weird and eerie but they're not identical i mean neither physically their fingertips aren't their you know their fingerprints aren't the same because uh, that's a random developmental thing and their personalities aren't the same my, my first postdoctoral research study was studying twins getting them drunk and I can tell you, I mean, they looked sometimes exactly the same, but there were always differences in their behavior. And, and yeah, they always, you know, you'd study these, read these things about, you know, twins reared apart and they both had a dog called Skip and they had a red poster on the wall, all this kind of stuff. Uh, but, you know, there are eerie coincidences, which we all like and focus on. But they're, you know, identical twins are not identical. You're, I don't know about Barb Streisand's dogs. My guess is... They're not exactly the same as her lost dogs. And if you have a cat that's, say, a calico cat, it's not going to be the same because there's a whole random... Mm -hmm. It'll look completely different. So you might be very disappointed. Well, I'd love to see the grant application. <laughs> uh, I want to get twins drunk. Oh, hey, we, we didn't have to do it. We got a load of money from the Scotch Whiskey Association. I'm not joking. <laughs> right, that's crazy. Okay. Well, I mean, the, the one thing... Uh, one of the three things you mentioned was gene yeah. drives. Now, like... Un unlike Monsanto, which wants its product to be sterile so that they can keep people coming back to, you know, purchase the next batch of seed, this is intentionally designed to, you know, be fertile, yeah. right? So the, the goal is to go go forth and multiply, right? So you want to find a, a mosquito that is, you know, resistant to uh, malaria and, and then have them go and, and kind of take over the, the population. Um so, you know, where are we there? And, and is, is, this, is this something, I mean, why one would think that the creatures that are out there in the environment are the ones that are best adapted to the environment. And so when we throw these new ones out into the population, that they would presumably, I mean, we look at feral pigs, right? Feral pigs are often, you know, pigs that escaped from domestication. 
and it doesn't take long before they kind of morph into, you know, wild pigs because those domestic genes don't really help yep. them like out there in, in the wild. So, so how does, how does, I mean, how do the gene drives actually work? Well, uh, the main thing they do is that they copy themselves. So uh, the things that people are interested in is in particular sterility. So they're trying to get rid of mosquitoes. There are various talks about trying to make mosquitoes immune to malaria, but if you just think back, what do I back to what I said about uh, about um, uh, various resistant forms of insect? Then you can just think, wait a minute, that's going to mean what's going to happen to the malaria parasite? It's actually going to mutate and a, it's going to become resistant, and that means it might might resist our drugs as well. So that could be a very bad thing. But there are some people who are trying to think of fancy ways of doing this because, of course, the, the mosquito doesn't hurt us it's the parasite that it's got within it so the idea that people have is to basically do at the moment when you hear about these releases of mosquito in uh, in Calif in florida for example people are releasing sterile males now males don't bite it's only the females that bite and the sterile male will mate with a female and that means you don't get any babies <laughs> so the population will collapse and that may mean that you can then, if you've got a disease transmitting area, that you can then, for example, cure all the humans of malaria, give them drugs or whatever. So when the mosquitoes return, they bite people. There's no malaria that they can then transmit. So that's what we do at the moment, right? We create, uh, using x-rays or chemicals, uh, sterile uh, mosquitoes, and we release vast numbers of them. And this works. This has worked. There's something called the screw worm, which was a terrible uh, farm pest in the southwest of America. And it was eliminated uh, by releasing loads and loads of these flies, sterile, you know, bazillions of sterile flies, which mated with the females, males mated with the females, and the population disappeared. So it can work. We can remove pests that way. But that was an invasive pest. It wasn't something that naturally lived in the, the US environment. The difference is that if you can do this in a uh, wild population mosquitoes and the gene drive will copy itself every generation. So instead of, uh, if, you have, if you've got two genes, everybody's got two copies of each gene, yeah, including mosquitoes. So if you've made a super mosquito that is weird in some way or resists malaria, then you pass, you give half of your genes to each of your offspring, yeah, just like your mum and dad did. So that means your offspring have now only got one copy of your gene. But what a gene drive does is it now copies itself over to the other chromosome. So your offspring have two copies and their offspring and their offspring and their offspring. So it basically grows exponentially. The people who first created one of these things, they've been theorized before. And these people uh, created it without knowing about all the arguments that had been for about 15 years about whether this was a good idea. Um, they called it a, a genetic chain reaction. And that's exactly what it is. I mean, it's a, it's a genetic bomb. So in, in the laboratory, this works very well. And in large cages, you can disappear a whole population of mosquitoes. As I said they're primarily working on sterility. Um, I'm not going to explain. You know, they transmit sterility. It sounds kind of incomprehensible, but it, don't trust me, it works. Uh, and you can get rid of a whole population of mosquitoes in a, in a big cage uh, within a few generations. So this would work. The question is, then what happens? What happens to the environment you've altered? Because although no one... No species simply lives on a particular mosquito. In a way, it's worse because there are lots and lots and lots of species which all eat mosquitoes or their little wriggling babies in the water. And if even some of those species go a little bit hungry, then, you know, these things, ecology is full of cascades and unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, you know, you can say, well, look, you know, if I was a, you know, 600,000 people every year die of malaria, okay? The vast majority of them are children under five. And if I'm a parent in uh, an African village where there is such high death rates, I'm going to take this, right? You know, because you don't want your children to die. I get that. But, and I, saw, and I also think they should have a, a right of veto if they don't want it for whatever reason. But should they have the right to decide for the region, the country, the continent, the planet? Because mosquitoes move about, you know, Zika disease, Zika virus, which ended up causing such problems in uh, in Brazil, originated in Africa, where it is not too much of a problem. And the mosquitoes aren't a problem, but the mosquitoes and the virus went across the Atlantic on boats, you know, the larvae in pails of water on a boat 
and then invaded South America, both the virus and the mosquito changed. And now we've got a big problem with this very unpleasant disease. So you could have unintended ecological consequences. We could have uh, changes you know, around the planet. And we don't know enough about ecology to be able to say, OK, this is great. But we've got those people die. Now, perhaps there's a solution because you may know that the WHO has just approved a new uh, vaccine for malaria, which is fantastic news. I mean, people have been banging away at this for decades. That may form, may, I mean, if this is for children and this can save lives and we will see a massive reduction in the death rate if there is good uptake. The other thing that we can do is to alter the mosquitoes, but not genetically. So many insects and people have been fascinated by, about this for about 30 years. Many insects have bacteria or other parasites in them that just live in them. And this means that when they mate with other members of their species or sli slightly different members of their species, the offspring are sterile. And there have been a number of trials of this, in not on malaria causing mosquitoes, but in other versions where you infect the mosquito with the, the bacterium. It's quite OK. It doesn't know. It flies about. It bites everybody. But when it mates, it doesn't produce it produces for a sterile offspring. So you've done the same thing of reducing the population size, uh, not eliminating it completely, which is what a gene drive would technically do, but substantially depressing it. But again, maybe the uh, well, certainly the the plasmodium, as it's called, the uh, the malaria mosquito, the malaria uh, parasite is going to fight back. So, again, we've got this problem of creating an arms race. Do we want to do that? I mean, these are really big questions. I'm not clever enough to work out the answer. We need international all these things. We need international regulation of this. And this applies to AI as well, I think, you know. And the problem is we live in a world in which, although there are examples of regulatory bodies, civil aviation authority, right? You, I mean, when you get on a plane, you know it's going to be OK because there is the International Civil Aviation uh, Organization, which was set up after the Second World War, which regulates. You don't have to sign up to it. You could have your own airline, your own airport, which didn't part sign up to this. But who would you'd be crazy to get on an airplane that didn't have that kind of backing? Um, the same with... The International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, you know, that regulates international atomic energy. These are both very dangerous technologies. And yet, with good regulation, they are quite safe. And I think those are the models we need to be thinking about for all these areas of having some kind of international body which people can sign up to. It doesn't have to be, you know, uh, imposed from on the top. It should be all be a big, be agreeing to it and all the rest of it. And that's where it gets really hard because the science and the ethics is hard enough, right? But now we're talking politics because, as you know, the US, for example, hasn't signed up to the International Criminal Court mm -hmm. uh, and many other countries. Russia hasn't either. So uh, mm -hmm. there's no appetite for international regulation on a global scale. There was after the Second World War because, duh, it had been horrible and everybody thought we better make sure this doesn't happen again. So, I mean, my, the end point of my book is, well, we're going to have to think about this very hard. And that's one reason why I care quite a bit about it, because it, it's not going to move without people, people caring and then making politicians care, because politicians aren't going to bother about this unless there's some kind of recognition, like with AI, that this could go wrong. And the only way... Of, well, yeah, just, to, sorry. Just, to dig in, just to dig in that analogy with AI, right? When, when people talk about all the things that can go wrong with AI. I mean, I'm thinking in terms of like bias, right? Yeah. People say, oh, look at all the bias in AI, right? Well, the proper comparison is not with perfection, but with whatever it is that the AI would be replacing, right? Which is the, the, the human algorithm, which, you know, has plenty of bias, right? Wow. So it, the question is, you know, is, it, is there less bias, right? In the, in the algorithm than the human. And, and so, you know, everything that is said about genetic engineering could also be said about, you know, selective breeding, let's say, right? I mean, there's unintended consequences, right? And so why, why wouldn't we say, um, well, here, you know, instead of doing some selective breeding where we're targeting one change and we might get like a gazillion other changes sort mm -hmm, of absolutely. accidentally, we can go in and, and, and like precision snip, right, with CRISPR and just make sure that we get the little thing that we want like just like in, in in ai we can just say oh let's delete the column on race let's delete the column on gender which you can't do in the human brain when you're making decisions right so isn't this i mean you, you quote Stuart brand and and i think this was a great way to end the book and he said 
you know, let's not talk about not being gods. Like, let's just, we are gods. Let's just figure out how to, you know, be good at it, right? So isn't, isn't like being really precise about it, doesn't this enable us to, to, to avoid some of the unintended consequences in ways that we couldn't before? Well, the first thing is to see whether we are gods, right? Because there's a lot of rhetoric. And I mean, the US title is not my title. I know it goes down very well over there, right? <laughs> but uh, uh, that's not what I call the book. I call the book The Genetic Age, Our Perilous Quest to Edit Life. Uh, and you, the US title is much more dramatic. And it also includes the word moral, which I, I don't feel very comfortable with. Um, but uh, I think the first thing is, OK, what about the rhetoric, right? So God's the precision you've just been talking about. CRISPR, it's a pair of scissors. It's really precise. It just changed that. Well, that depends. It turns out to be unbelievably complicated. And, for example, in uh, primate embryos, and this includes humans, if you use CRISPR when you're manipulating an embryo, then... It's not a pair of scissors. It's like a chainsaw run amok. You can lose whole chromosomes. And this has become, people who become aware of this over the last two, two three years. You call this genetic butchery. Yeah, I mean, well, that right, absolutely. You said genetic butchery. You know, it is, it, I mean, it may be possible to do it safely, okay? And then we've got to talk about the, 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 the ethical issues. But the, uh, at the moment, this is incredibly unsafe, uh, in particular in, in, in primates and in humans. Uh, I mean, when I talk to this to my students about this, they go, but wait a minute. I mean, we had a lecture last week and the, the guy said he'd just been doing it on his mice and it was all going great. I said, yeah, but if a mouse dies in the lab, nobody cares, right? You can just get another mouse and you carry on doing it until it works. I don't want this done to my genes. Uh, I want, you know, and then having cells put into my body unless I'm absolutely certain it's fine. And I certainly don't ever want it happening to any offspring uh, of me or of anybody else. Uh, and at the moment, this is incredibly dangerous. So we're nowhere near being gods. On the other hand, your point about about um, selective breeding is absolutely right. And I think, for example, with plants in particular, then there is the possibility that uh, although plants really don't like doesn't CRISPR is really hard to get working in plants. I mean, there's all sorts of tech, you know, behind the myths, behind the the the, the, the one phrase, you know, buzzword word which gets all the tech bros excited. There is amazingly hard biology and plants don't like it very much having their cells crispered. And you've got to understand really exactly where and when you can do this and how. And that will change from species to species. It's infuriating. But in principle, let's forget all the problems. In principle, then, yes, changing letters of DNA very precisely should enable the development, say, of new plants that can resist desiccation, uh, you know, resist drought or something like that, or respond better to climate change. And it's far more precise than the current procedure which we have, which is, I mean, we, do do, we don't even do selective breeding anymore. Basically, you, you create bazillions of mutant plants, you then put them in the situation using x-rays or a mutagen, you put them all in a field and you see which ones grow. I mean, it's not in a field, it's in a, in a lab greenhouse. And then you select them and you, then you've got to breed from them and then, and then and that takes forever. So, yes, this could be, if the public can accept this, and I'm not sure whether they will or they won't. I mean, I think in general they should do if it's safe, if nothing else has been altered in the plant genome and it's simply the genetic information that's been altered, then this can, could be remarkably useful. Well, Matthew, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much for joining me. The new book is called, well, okay, in, in the U.S., <laughs> it's called As, As Gods, and in the U.K. it's got a much more sober yeah. Uh, no, title quick. you can't the, the genetic age, age yeah um and it's great yeah. to talk i mean yeah you have to get me back to talk about all the other stuff yeah of course we we didn't even touch we this book touch which book. was the reason why i reached out to you which is the idea of the brain and also my favorite sense of course uh smell and i gotta figure out like how on earth you also have a completely alternative career and personality as a historian of, of world war ii wow. and um you know, talk about unsiloed. That that's a. Uh, I, I had not read those books, but I ordered okay. them all, and so I'm going to go and 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 maybe read them uh, on on vacation well, whenever I have. The second one, of one those. is on the liberation of Paris. So my advice to you is to go in Paris and to go to Paris in August, and uh, walk around and see what was happening in 1944. I'll do that. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. It's been great. 
This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.